Bueno, muy buenas tardes. Thank you very much for coming here to the symposium of uh, Medicontour. It's a pleasure for us to having you here and this uh, incredible panel of uh, opponent uh, with uh, Professor Satish Srinava, Ramon Ruiz Meza, and Javier Mendicute. But uh, first of all, if you allow me, let's go in to see uh, a little <coughs> introduction about uh, medical tool. This is going to be the presentation we would like to share with you, coming from the evidence of uh, what we can learn for our clinical practice to master intraocular lens, uh, simultaneous visual lens of the portfolio of uh, Medicontour. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to do the first presentation. If you can share with me the first presentation, please. Thank you very much. We are going to talk with you about uh, liberty in depth, the last five years of evidence uh, to achieve excellent in clinical outcomes. So this is our declaration of interest. As uh, more of you know, we are consultant of Medicon Tour. I think it's important for you to know. It could have some uh, relationship in the presentation. So we began to implant uh, Liberty Lens in 2016, and the next year we have the first uh, publication, the first paper published in the European Journal of Thermology by the group of Javier Garcia Bella. This is, was the first report published in the literature, and you can see more or less the outcomes, the efficacy of the, this trifocal lens. It's very interesting to see in the distant corrected visual acuity that uh, this lens could have because uh, avoid the noise of the uh, refraction. And as you see, in monocular situation, you are going to see in distance zero log mark. Of course, you know that it's 2020. The intermediate, 0 0.28, and the near, 0 0.13. One year after, we publish our first uh, paper based on this uh, trifocal lens, based on the liberty. Um, we can validate these first uh, outcomes of this first group, Garcia La Bella, and we confirm the efficacy in monocular or the distance around zero logma, 2020, in monocular, the intermediate 0 0.2, and a near of 0 0.1, so it's an excellent uh, visual acuity. But it's very interesting also that we publish, we report also some interesting biometric data relationship for example, this, uh, this, uh, this lens is going to be localized exactly in the same place that the crystalline lens uh, has. It's a little uh, temporal and inferior. As you can see here, we, we have this natural uh, uh, movement, this natural uh, little eccentration, less than 0 0.3 millimeter. We are going to improve the intermediate vision. It's very interesting to know that is going to have, after the surgery, the same place that the natural crystalline. 
In 2018, we could have the optimization of the constants for the medical control calculator, and in this year, uh, we used to use the SRKT uh, formula. So we move from 78% of the patient around 0.5 dietaries to 83% that it was in this year, more or less, the percentage of the major part of the worldwide surgeries. In 2019, we present in this paper our formula lens based on the thick lens. As you know, with a thick lens formula, we need to know exactly the profilometry of the intraocular lens. It's absolutely customized for this lens, for the Liberty. It's customized also for the biometer. In our case, it was Pentacan, and also the surgery because of the ELP. In this year, in 2019, we published in Journal Reflective Surgery a model of prediction. So it was very interesting to understand the role of the pupil diameter for you to know, based not only in, visual, in terms of visual acuity, but also in terms of contrast sensitivity and independent of the pupil of the patient. So it's very interesting if you are going to implant this lens, what could be the behavior independent of the pupil of the patient? And the first question would be, is this an adapted to our patient? This was also our question. And we published this year in 2020, uh, what was the normal pupil diameter of our, pu of our patient? As you can see, independent of the age, we are going to have a little difference. But the 96% in reading conduction, we are going to have less than 3.5 millimeter, less than 83% uh, of uh, five millimeters in night condition driving, and 85% uh, less than four millimeters in low photopic illumination condition. So as you can see, this profilometry of only seven ring is adapted to the pupil of our patient that we discover in, in the practical, in the clinical practice. So in 2021, it was very interesting because uh, some publish, some publication tell us that it was very interesting for the calculation of the toric intraocular lens to estimate the posterior cornea. So the medical control calculator with a correction of Abulafia approach led to clinically compare outcomes with the Barrett calculator estimating the posterior cornea as we report in this publication. After that, it would be interesting to see what happened. What happened with the a posterior capsule opacification. And we compared two lenses, this Liberty, with another lens of the competence, exactly with the same material. And it was very interesting to see that the median time to require capsulotomy was 30 months with Liberty, and with the other lens, reduced to uh, 20 months. So uh, it's not only the material, it's also the platform. And it's very interesting to know that in the first year, only the seven percent of the patient required laser jack. Well, in 2023, we have a change in the profilometry of liberty. We changed from EPS1 to EPS2. And what happened? As you can see, keeping visual acuity for distant and for near, we improved one and a half line of intermediate vision in monocular, as you can see. It was very interesting also, this paper that we published with the idea of creating a screening of estimating what could be the contrast sensitivity of the patient before the surgery in comparison with the post-operative in order not to reduce the contrast sensitivity of the patient. As you can see here in this paper, if we operate patient older, more or less in average of 62 years, we are not going to reduce the contrast sensitivity of our patient. And if you have the all OCAS, the HD analyzer, the cutoff for the OC would be 1.25. If you have the eye trace, the DLA would be less than 7.67. 7 and if you have the Pentacam, the cutoff would be the <coughs> PENES one. Another thing very interesting to know would be what could be the cutoff not to improve a positive dysphotopsia in our patient when you compare the sclerosis crystalline of our patient? So 
we discover a cutoff in the preoperative when the patient tells us that with the normal crystalline, a sclerosis of the crystalline, pass from a slightly to moderate the bothersome of the dysphotopsia. This was the cutoff, but take a look to the allometer index, the LDA would be less than uh, 15%. So if we operate less than 15, patient is going to have only a slightly uh, bothersome and we operate more, they are going to improve the bothersome. So this cutoff is exactly the photic phenomenon that we discover with the Liberty 2.0. So as you can see, the outcomes of the photic phenomenon apparently is going to be in the top of the slightly and don't cover the moderate. So it would be interesting to know that. But what could have in the clinical practice? As you can see, we go directly to the publication of all the paper of edot lenses. On the top, you are seeing the dysphotopsia of the diffractive edot lenses. Of course, all of us know that create more dysphotopsia sensation. And in the bottom, we have the edot refractive. And in this paper, this it's going to publish is in the last uh, phases of the review. In our experience, only the 7% of the patient implanted with the EPS 2.0 is bothered with this photopsia is quite similar, as you can see, with the head of refractive lenses. Another, and for last, it's very interesting. In this year, we also published the predictability that was improved from 80% in 2018 to 94% this year with our own formula, use, or if you can use Barrett, Kane, or Evo, with a constant OSTMS for the Pentagon AXL. So in conclusion, this new platform of Liberty are going to have the performance of a trifocal lens. We improved the intermediate vision without adjusting the distant and the near uh, visual acuity. And uh, last year, I told you that uh, my our sensation, our opinion, was that the rate of the photosia would be comparable to refractive head of lenses right now is not an opinion. Right now is not a sensation we publish in the literature. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and I would like to invite to Dr. Javier Mendicuti to tell us the technical and clinical difference between the head of intraocular lens and his experience with head of lens. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. Firstly, my thanks to Medicontour and to Dr. Joaquin Fernandez for this invitation. Uh, I have, uh, I want to speak about uh, my first experience with a long intraocular lens, but I think that I will be focused in some aspects related with the clinical practice. My financial disclosures, and after that, we have many classifications related with the intraocular lenses, but I'm going to the 2019, when a new concept appeared, the concept of monofocals advanced or plus monofocal intraocular lenses. That kind of lenses offer us the possibility to, or they had a focal length, offer us the possibility to have excellent visual quality for distant distances, at least comparable to monofocals, with low incidence of positive dysphotopsias, and they promise lower use of intermediate that not near glasses. In this context, we have many platforms. I have been working in clinical trials and clinical practice with the techniques I hands and the lentis comfort, but I think that in this range of intraocular lenses, they work in different ways. Some of them working with the aberical, the the a spherical aberration in the center of the lens, uh, other with the bifocal segments, so we inc in, including diffractive rings in some cases. I think that there are many, many kinds of monofocal, advanced monofocals. On the other hand, in the 2015, appeared the concept of EDOF. The EDOF is, uh, at least for me, uh, quite difficult concept to understand. They, this kind of lenses, they have to offer excellent visual qualities for far distances, 
a wider uh, range of vision. And the third one is for me the more confusing because the 50% of the patient, they have to have more than 0.20 at the distance of uh, 66 centimeters. What happens with the other 50%? No? Relative, I think that the predictability to obtain good intermediate vision is quite low for some of them. In this area, I have been working in clinical trial with the AcuFocus, with the Alcon BBT, with the LARA, and the Technic Symphony. And in the clinical practice, I work with the BBT, the LARA, and the Technic Symphony. I have experience in these platforms. But now, in the last few months, appeared this intra new intraocular lens, included in this area of, of intraocular lenses, the LON, the LON concept. The LON is uh, one hydrophobic intraocular lens with a filter for blue light. Uh, it's similar to others, but some small differences. The main, uh, some of them are the optic, with the fenestrated optic that offers the possibility to uh, establish a, a bigger contact with the capsular bag in order to obtain better stability in the long time. And the main change related with others is the, the structure that the, the intraocular lens has just in the middle, two visible circular areas called linking zones. This seems uh, a little bit to the BVT intraocular lens, but they are optically different. This is a magnification of the structure of the central area. We can see the curvature base, the refractive areas, and the more important things are the linking zones uh, connecting the areas that I have mentioned before. It's the technology that the company has called waveform linking technology. This technology creates an elongated focus across far and intermediate distances using carefully selected waveform forming elements. And the main issue is related with the interconnecting areas between the different areas of the intraocular lens. This technology offers some characteristics. From the clinical point of view, it, uh, the intraocular lens is preloaded. It's very easy to manage it because it's very intuitive. You have one marks uh, for relating with the different steps. The first one, you have to introduce the viscoelastic through this hole. The second one, you have to rotate this, this, this area. And once it's rotated, you have to extract the stopper and the intraocular lens is ready for implantation. My first impression, it was that it was a very, very easy uh, intraocular lens to be implanted through 2.2 millimeters of wide. And the, 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 the behavior of the intraocular lens is very smoothly, is smoothly, is very easy to uh, implant in the capsular bag. And the structure is a little, a little bit different to the BBT because the BBT it's quite difficult to observe it in the uh, microscope, and here the area is perfectly identified. It's well-centered, and my first opinion with my first implantation uh, was excellent related with that. The company uh, is working in different clinical trials, some of them related with this intraocular lens. There are the results that the company offer, excellent visual acuities for far distances, for intermediate and for uh, reading distances also one month and three months later. My experience is more limited. I have implanted five patients bilaterally. I present my results one week after the surgery because I have had no time for more. And it's true that the majority of them, they have excellent visual acuity for far distances. I have included 100% of the patient in plus minus uh, 0.50. Uh, the intermediate vision is good, but probably not so good as the, uh, the result that offer the company, but it's true that this one a week later and, this, and with this kind of platform, the visual equity improves on time with the follow-up. My binocular data, they were a little bit better than I have been, I, I have demonstrated before. This is the, the focus curve that offers the company, but the, the focus curve developed with few patients. But if we compare this platform, this the focus curve is similar to the focus curve that offers BBT uh, in different publications. But we are we searching for some comments related with that. We have full range of focus intraocular lenses that offer the possibility to 
a leaf free of reading and distance glasses. But what happens with that kind of lenses? The positive dysphotopsia is, uh, is the main difficult for, for them. In this way, I, th I, I want to speak about the activity and the required visual acuity for different activities. We have uh, priority driving and reading speed are activities that demand better visual acuity. We need at least 0.3 log mark for driving and 0.2 log mark for reading speed. For reading with 0.4 could be enough, but if we would uh, 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 want a visual acuity for reading speed, it's 0.2. And we are searching also this kind of binocular defocus curves. Uh, platforms with high tolerance to residual refractive errors in this area, close to zero, and an excellent depth of focus. It's, diff it's quite difficult to obtain that with intraocular lenses. But the real war, in the real war, we have that the cataract is, uh, the number of patients with cataract is growing, is a very big marker for the next uh, years. We, the forecast related to cataract surgery in 20, in 30 years, we will be uh, performing more than 50 millions of cataract procedures. But in the developed countries, we are working with dysfunctional lens syndrome that open us many different markets. Uh, it's true that the age of, for refractive uh, lens exchange is uh, decreasing the decades of, for surgery, and the market is also improving. The growth projection, uh, projection for refractive lens exchange is growing about uh, the 2-3% uh, per year, and we hope that this will be maintained in the next year. But the presbyocular correcting IOLs are quite limited. More than the 60% of the patient were implanted without this kind of intraocular lenses. Many, many uh, issues related with that. But if we review the market relative with different platforms, the number of bifocals is decreasing. With the trifocal, it maintains similar in the last year with the pandemic area, I suppose, a change in that tendency. And the group of uh, intraocular lenses that increase uh, the, or are growing, the number of implantation are the uh, head of intraocular lenses. With this comment, my opinion, that not conclusion, is related with this kind of intraocular lenses. The full range of focus intraocular lenses is still the best option to provide the spectacles independence, but only for healthy people only for people who are highly, highly motivated to be a spectacle independent and uh, willing to tolerate nighttime halos, or for people we can afford them. For increasing range of focus, intraocular lenses is still the best option to provide the spectacle's independence. Um, I'm sorry, uh, increasing range of focus lenses. We have the highest volume growth in the coming years as I have mentioned, but for people who don't mind having glasses around and limited use in refractive lens exchange for metropic and myopic patients because they don't the capability to offer uh, good uh, intermediate and uh, near distances and for people who can afford them. And an important factor is the attitude of prescribing ophthalmologists because we need a friendly technology that offers good results. We need to know what the technology offers and what are the best indication criteria for a given intraocular lens. And I think that the best way for doctors that don't practice implantation of trifocal or uh, premium intraocular lenses could be practice cataract and with monofocal, then with monofocal plus, and probably then with a DOF. And this kind of surgery can be performed for general ophthalmologists. But if you want to work with the refractive lessons change, I think that we will need to work also with B and trifocals intraocular lenses. And probably this kind of technology is limited for refractive surgery. Uh, but it's true that the DOF, I think, has, is an excellent way to explore this area, offering out to our patient intermediate and probably for the majority of them excellent or sufficient visual acuity for reading distances. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Javier. Um, uh, now, Dr. Ramon Ruiz Mesa is going to tell us his experience with uh, Liberty Toric and the Elon Lens and what could he do? 
Diputadas, uh, Trifocality or Fedor Lenses? Hi, good afternoon to everybody. First of all, thanks, uh, Joaquin, for your kind invitation, and of course, to all the Medicon Tour team. The title of my, of my speech will be What Would You Do, Trifocal, Oid of Lens, Choosing a Right Lens for Your Patient. We have that before it's mandatory for every surgeon of uh, anterior segment to control and master the process of the cataract surgery, to know and adapt to the needs and hobbies of the patient, to know and choose the best option for the patient, and to present real expectation to our patient. But we have asked for ourselves what does the patient as us, adjust the patient to his length and not the other way around, it's not mandatory to operate to everybody, and spending the necessary time in the office is never wasting it. There are many types of demands questionnaire in order to know the profile and selection for the patient. Regarding about the profile and selection, we have to be sure if the patient is motivated, distinguish between hobbies and profession, of course, count on the age and physio physiological profile, not conclude until ending the preoperative examination. It's a very, I think that's a very good advice. The first priority is to avoid the preoperative complication. Not select the uh, not suitable patient for a multifocal lens or an ADOF lens. For this, we need a complete examination, as in of the tier, quality and quantify, dynamic photopic and mesopic pupillometry, <laughs> premium biometry and advanced formula, premium coronal tomography, anterior and posterior surface, and of course, aberrometry, high order aberration, and uh, true valor rate alpha and kappa angles. Now we have different uh, groups in order to restore the accommodation. The most popular, as you know, there are multifocal, like it of lengths, and the plus monofocal, and sometimes, in some cases, monovision procedure. This is now the distribution of lenses. Uh, we are talking about the monofocal and multifocal lenses in the main market in Europe. And you have to, to select the lens. Nowadays, we have many, many type of lenses, many type of, of group of lenses, where we have to gap every, every patient with his model. Uh, talking about the Liberty lens, Liberty trifocal lens, Liberty lenses provide good visual equity in distant, intermediate, and near vision offer optical vision range between zero and minus three diopter, similar contrast sensitivity in photopic and mesopic vision, very good feature, external rotational centering instability, and this lens provides satisfactory results at all distances compared to the other premium lenses. Suitable patient for this type of lens, patient doesn't wish to wear glasses for any activities, patient who demand near functional vision, reading books like small print letters, patient who do not drive normally at night, and patient with 100% healthy eyes. Here I, I would like to show you the study we have uh, shown in this meeting uh, regarding visual and refractive outcomes of a single piece of acrylic spherical trifocal toric intraocular lenses. The purpose of this study was to analyze the visual and refractive outcomes of taking cataract facing implanted with the Liberty toric intraocular lenses. We have a study 30 eyes in 15 uh, patients. There were the result, the mean values obtained for uh, corrected distance visual, the uh, uncorrected di visual distance and intermediate. No intra and postoperative complications were found. On the right, you can see the defocus curve of these lenses. The mean spherical uh, equivalent was 0 0.05. 33% and 93% of die were plus minus 0 0.5 and one diopter. This result is very important to, to analyze this graphic, uh, comparing the preoperative coronal stigmatism with the postoperative refractive stigmatism obtained. You know the centroid in the center, we reduce the, the result of the stigmatism in very, very low values. To conclude, to the present analysis that is most for implantation of the Liberty Toric intraocular length show that this length offers excellent visual and refractive outcomes at different distances without intra and postoperative adverse events. Another lens that uh, of my colleague, Dr. Mendiguti, has uh, talked before, Elon lens. Elon lens, we have to, to underline, is not yet another EDOP lens. It's the it offer as a completely new uh, development. It's a refractive lens, like Miniwell, really, and not it's a diffractive 
like uh, AT LAR and symphony lenses, both technology, whether refractive and diffractive design, can with an inherent increase in photic phenomena. The suitable patient for this type of lens, the Vidov Elon lens, this lens is most tolerant for patients with high, high order aberration values, patients who demand near functional vision. Given that it's a lens with a very low halo ratio, they are suitable for patients requiring very good night vision. The low range of halos make them ideal lenses for patients with well-controlled glaucoma or retina diseases. The only weak point, of course, is the vision for close distances. For this reason, they are recommended for those who demand very good vision for these distances. The contrast sensitivity is similar to monofocal lenses and much better to diffractive and trifocal lenses. My short experience, the same experience of Dr. Mendigute, five patients, five bilateral patients, in total 10 eyes. We have evaluated visual equity, the focus score, contrast sensitivity, and the quality of vision questionnaire. This is our result in visual equity, outcome after two months of follow-up in, in, in five patients. The defaco score, very good performance at every distance, of course, less uh, behavior in the near uh, distance. Uh, regarding the contrast sensitivity, we uh, can uh, achieve very good contrast sensitivity in mesopic and photopic mm -hmm. condition. And if we analyze uh, the quality of vision, the uh, questionnaire, absence of photic phenomena. For this, my short, so uh, they are impression, no conclusion. After 10 Elon lenses is planted, patient with a brilliant quality of vision, patient without photic phenomena complaints, and very tolerant to a small minimum of vision. We are not going to increase the photic phenomena, given that it's not a diffractive design without presence of halos. That's all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ramon. And now, Professor Satis Srivijinbasan is going to tell us about the first Q add-on in Chocolate Lens, what could be the science, the indication, and also the technique of implantation. Okay, thank you, Kim. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to slightly change gears, and I'm going to talk about a different technology, which is called the add-on lenses. So in the next few minutes, I'll talk to you about why you need anode lenses, what is an add-on lens, when to do and when not to do, and then hopefully share your video and some surgical pearls on how you do it. So many years ago in the 90s and uh, uh, in the 1990s, when patients had very high intraocular powers, the intraocular lens uh, companies were not able to manufacture, the so surgeons started putting two intraocular lenses uh, within the capsular bag to meet the uh, IOL power requirements. So this is the first report uh, where uh, <coughs> in pediatric eyes, Guyton had to implant two high-powered lenses to achieve an intraocular lens power of 45 diopters. So this kind of caught on. And uh, lo lo there were a lot more reports and of uh, surgeons using this technology. Then we started developing a new complication called interlenticular opacification, uh, which happens when you put two intraocular lenses within the capsular bag. And you can understand from this uh, illustration, you can see if you put two lenses in the bag, normally the lens epithelial cells, which will go around to the posterior capsule to develop posterior capsular opacification, couldn't do that because there is no space. So these lens epithelial cells start going between these two intraocular lenses and to start uh, producing what a new compli complication called interlenticular opacification, where it starts affecting the optical quality. So these are pictures courtesy of Liliana Werner from Salt Lake City in Utah, where there are two uh, PCIOLs, three-piece lenses, which have been explanted. And you can see this lens epithelial cells, which have grown into the interface and produce a lot of opacification on the optical surface. So once started uh, seeing these complications, patients, uh, surgeons started uh, reducing the usage of this technology. Then the new, new problem started coming because we didn't have specifically designed intraocular lenses. Surgeons started putting intraocular lenses which are designed to be put in the capsular bag, but they started putting them in the sulcus. And we all know that while that happens, the classic lenses which we put in the bag have got very sharp square edges to reduce uh, PCO. But if you put these sharp uh, square edge lenses in the, in the sulcus, they start rubbing against the posterior iris pigment epithelium. Then you start iris pigment deposits, not only on the um, intraocular lens surface, but you also started developing secondary um, pigment dispersion glaucoma uh, and iris transalbination defects. So there was a need for the um, industry to develop specifically designed lenses to be implanted, not in the capsular bag, 
but to be specifically designed to be implanted in the ciliary sulcus. So there are a few IOL characteristics which we need. These lenses cannot be hydrophobic. All these lenses have to be hydrophilic because they are but much more biocompatible. They have a convex concave optic. I'll show you some illustrations so that they don't come in touch with the primary IOL in the capsular bag. They are uh, posterior haptic angulation, so they, they stay away from the posterior iris pigment epithelium. Most importantly, these, pair, these lenses don't have a square edge, so they don't rub against the posterior iris pigment epithelium. So this is the first Q add-on lens, which is, shows all the characteristics which I have described to you. It has got a plain uh, a convex concave on, uh, uh, optic. It has got a posterior haptic angulation, and it is specifically designed to be placed only in the ciliary sulcus uh, as an add-on procedure. So these lenses cannot be placed within the capsular bag. And coming to the sp uh, specific design characteristics of the first Q add-on lenses, these has got four point. Uh, th these have got four haptics, which gives you four point haptic fixation, which gives you excellent stability within the ciliary sulcus. These haptics are very very flexible. I'll show you some pictures. These lenses look square, but they don't have, uh, they have a square design, but they don't have a square edge. These are uh, rounded edges, uh, and they have got convex concave optics, so there is no primary touch. And most importantly, these can be uh, injected like a primary eye well with a clear corneal 2.2 millimeter self-sealing incision. The other beauty of this technology is this is reversible. Sorry, so these are some uh, animal, uh, uh, sorry, human cadaveric studies which we did. This is the Apple Mayaki view where you can see the uh, IOL as if imagine yourself lying on the retina and looking up from inside the eye. So where we have removed all the uh, irises, these are ciliary processes which you see 360 degrees and we wanted to evaluate these are, uh, these are cadaver uh, pseudophagic eyes. In this example, you see a single piece plate haptic IOL which has been placed in the capsular bag. This is a three-piece IOL which has been kept, um, placed in the capsular bag. So we took about 15 eyes, which had got different kinds of primary IOLs in the capsular bag, and then we implanted uh, the add-on lenses in the ciliary sulcus. Once again, people who do fake IOL surgery, you know the ciliary sulcus diameter is very variable. Because of these flexible haptics, these haptics can flex or they can elongate to meet the variable varying anatomy of the ciliary sulcus. And we did, we did with anti anterior segment OCT. The cornea has been removed. So all you're seeing is the primary IOL in the capsular bag, the secondary IOL in the sulcus, and you can put a digital caliper and you can measure the difference uh, and the space between the primary IOL in the bag and the secondary IOL in the sulcus. As this example, you can see there's a space of 1.24 millimeter. Once again, that's because of the convex concave or uh, um, configuration of the optic. So we published this uh, about five years ago. So where do you want to use these lenses? One, this, this, got, uh, this lens comes in different flavors. It has got a spherical correction. You could have a monofocal toric correction. Then you could have a trifocal uh, uh, optic on this like the Liberty, and there's a trifocal toric. So if somebody had a previous monofocal IOL correction with the standard monofocal IOL, and if they're interested in having a presbyopia correction, then you can put this uh, toric IOL, you can put this trifocal add-on as a presbyopia correcting uh, add-on solution. If the patients have coexisting astigmatism, then you could correct simultaneously with the trifocal toric. Or if the patients had monofocal and if they have residual refractive either uh, errors, either spherical or with toricity, that could be connected either with a, a refractive uh, add-on or with a refractive monofocal toric add-on. So it gives you quite a lot of, um, of flexibility to use for patients, especially patients had post keratoplasty if they have residual refractive error, which could be corrected with an add-on. Post-LASIK patients where there was errors in calculation, if you want to correct that, once again, there is a room to go and uh, uh, put this procedure. And the most exciting thing is patients who have been all be previously pseudophagic with the monofocal lenses, this gives you another, uh, opens up a new opportunity to have presbyopia correction for these uh, uh, patients. There are a few contraindications. Uh, all the animal studies showed us that the primary IOL has to be stable within the capsular bag. So if there is any zonal or weakness or if there is an IOL bag complex tilt, then these add-on lenses don't work. Remember, it's like putting a scaffold. The primary IOL in the capsular bag and the zonules have to be stable. Only then the add-on can sit stable. If the primary IOL is tilting, then the add-on will tilt and that will affect the results. So any patients who had complicated cataract surgery, ruptured anterior capsule, ruptured posterior capsule, anterior vitrectomy done, or even previous vitrectomies is going to affect the dynamics of the capsular bag IOL complex. So the, in my view, there would be uh, 
absolute contraindications for putting an IOL. As I said before, zonal or weakness, subluxated primary IOL in the capsular bag, and previous vitrectomy, either anterior or pars plana posterior vitrectomy. Previous ag legs or capsulotomy, in my view, is kind of a relative contraindication. If you've got learning experience and do it, uh, then you could use it in patients who have had previous YAG laser capsulotomies. Uh, sometimes if the YAG laser capsulotomy opening is far too big, uh, there are some uh, instances where the primary IOL has slipped away uh, into the vitreous during the process of injecting the IOL, secondary IOL, because of the uh, pressures in the anterior segment. So I will share with you a video of this. This is a patient of mine who had a trifocal IOL in the capsular bag, developed capsular bag distension syndrome, and had a myopic shift. As you can see, I've done a small posterior YAG laser capsulotomy to release the fluid, but the IOL didn't go back, so he has been left with a, a spherical and a toric residual uh, uh, error, sorry, spherical and cylindrical residual error. So we're going to put an add-on monofocal toric to correct that. The skill set which you require to put an add-on is very similar to a cataract surgery. In fact, it's much easier and much quicker. All you're going to do is use your OVD of choice, and you're going to open up the space in the posterior chamber. That's where the lens is going to sit. So it's, you know, it, there's nothing else to do. It's a self-sealing 2.2 millimeter clear corneal incision. You could open up your previous cataract wound if it's uh, uh, close enough. This lens is not preloaded, so you have to take a cartridge uh, coated with the OVD, and that's the lens. Once again, I would recommend don't allow your nursing staff to load this. This has to be done under the operating microscope, preferably by the surgeon because I've seen instances where the haptics have been uh, not correctly placed in the, in the groove and they have been tagged and they have been torn. So it's very important to make sure the optic as well as the four haptics are nicely tugged into the butterfly cartridge before you close and make sure you inject it outside the eye to make sure that the lens is uh, uh, going freely through the nozzle. As you can see, I am doing that, making sure that the lens is nicely coming out. Now I know I'm not going to have any problems. Once again, go back just before you inject the lens, inject some OVD to open up that space in the posterior chamber because that's where the lens is going to go. And it's very, it's a hydrophilic lens, so it nicely comes out. Uh, if you want to make a bigger incision, then you could do it, uh, you could push your nozzle straight into the center of the anterior chamber and then you can inject it. I would prefer to do it wound assisted. So this goes with a 2.2 millimeter. If you want to put your entire nozzle inside, then you probably require a 2.4 or 2.6. And these haptics can be uh, extremely flexible, so you could use any of your favorable second instrument, either a Kuglin hook or a Sinsky hook, uh, to guide these haptics uh, into the uh, posterior chamber behind the iris. Once again, it's a large six millimeter optic, so the lens is very, very robust, and it gives you that four point uh, fixation in the sulcus, so the, uh, any amount of toric uh, IOL which you put, the lenses are extremely stable. One of the most important surgical steps is which I'm going to demonstrate next, when you're going to remove the OVD, make sure you lift the uh, add-on lens and remove the residual OVD between the uh, IOL in the bag and the IOL and the IOL in the, uh, in the sulcus. Otherwise, these uh, OVD gets trapped, patient will have an intraocular pressure spike and you could almost have a secondary angle closure glaucoma. So it's not only important that you re remove the uh, OVD from the anterior chamber. I hope I haven't edited this off and I might be able to demonstrate. Yes, so I'm going to lift the IOL now and then spend a good few seconds making sure, coming out from both ends, make sure you remove all the residual OED and then you could make sure that the alignment of the um, toricity is in the correct meridian and always a good idea to inject myocol or myostat to make sure that there, there is no uh, optic capture and once again, to make sure that the lens is unstable. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward, well within the skill sets of any anterior segment surgeon, and gives you a great opportunity to correct uh, any of the residual refractive errors. And even if patients don't have any re residual refractive errors, it's a great presbyopia solution for patients who have been previously uh, pseudophagy with just with the monofocal. And this is <clears throat> the slit lamp view, once again, nicely illustrating um, the gap. The first reflex, which you see, is the second Perkunji reflex coming from the uh, add-on lens. Then you've got the nice black shadow, which is the area showing there is no contact. And then you've got the hyperreflective third figure, which is the third Perkunji image, uh, sorry, fourth Perkunji image coming from the anterior surface of the primary IOL in the bag. Once again, illustrating that this convex concave optic orientation gives that space. 
and prevents any direct contact between the two optics. And th there is an online calculator which is available. Once again, the other area I want to emphasize is if you are going to calculate the um, add-on lenses, it's pretty much based on the manifest refraction. So you want the manifest refraction to be stable. So don't rush in, repeat the refraction two or three times in a span of two to three months. Make sure that the manifest refraction is stable because that's one of the key ingredients in calculating the uh, add-on power. Then you need a pseudophagic anterior chamber depth pseudophagic axial length and pseudophagic K reading. So make sure you don't go, you make sure you go and change the parameters on your IOL or on your bio, optical biometer from phagic to pseudophagic because these are patients are pseudophagic obviously. So you need uh, pseudophagic uh, axial length, pseudophagic K reading, pseudophagic anterior chamber depth. And the other contraindication is to make sure that the anterior chamber depth from the endothelium to the IOL surface is at least 2.8 millimeters. Invariably, most of these you will have because these patients are pseudophagic, but the eye is extremely small, then that, that's a relative contraindication to use. So once you have got all these um, information, open up the uh, online calculator. You can plug in all the values, and that tells you at the bottom whether you just need a spherical lens or whether you need any cylindrical correction. In this example, you can see all it requires is a minus um, two, and a <coughs> two and three quarters of a sphere. There is no cylinder, so that online calculator will tell you uh, whether you need or what kind of correction you need. It also tells you if you can you can put in your incision size, you can put in your uh, incision meridian, and that calculates, uh, uh, gives you, and if you have data on your surgical induced tasting medicine, that could be factored in in, in uh, all the surgical planning. So all this is pretty much very similar to how you would calculate a primary uh, toric IOL. I think that's my last slide. Uh, thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much for your brilliant uh, presentation. I would like to, to know if you have any question from the audience. Yes, please. We have a microphone, please, here. How do you remove the first Q lens? What's your option? Do you still cut it? Do you just dry it out? Uh, uh, is it on? Okay, I'm, I'm sure I can be loud enough. I haven't removed one, but if you want to remove one, it's very easy. It's, it's, a, it's a hydrophilic lens, so you would cut it and remove it as you would normally do a primary IOL. Okay. So. Any other question? Yes, please, the microphone there. Uh, the, the contraindication, relative contraindication you have mentioned. Uh, uh, do you have mentioned uh, the, the eye which they had before the lazy yeah, capsulotomy? It's a kind of re relative contraindication. Is there any tips uh, for these eyes, for example, injection of viscoelastic beneath the, uh, the, the first lens? To, because we have, I have a case that I, I have to do it. it. It depends on how big the capsulotomy opening is, and if there is a good fibrosis in the capsular bag and in the anterior capsule, then you could be convinced that the, it, it is stable. But if you're going to start your first case, I wouldn't recommend uh, doing it because there is a little bit of pressure when you're injecting the lens, um, so that could have an effect depending on the, what the opening is. So the longer the amount of pseudophagia, there is more fibrosis, then the IOL back complex might be stable. If it's only six months or five months, then there is a big risk of the capsule opening up following capsule audit. Is there another question? Well, beginning from the last presentation, Satis, excellent, thank you very much. And we're implanting multifocality in our patient, probably in the early 60 years old, and probably they are going to have a long term with these lenses. The eye could have some morbidity, some problem of macular degeneration, glaucoma, whatever, that probably we would like to avoid this multifocality. So do you think we have right now the possibility of think about reversibility of the multifocality in general patient or not, and what type of patient, if for all the people or for very early stage of some disease, or what is your think about that? The, that's always a gamble when we do um, presbyopia correcting solutions. We can't predict what other comorbidity conditions patients would develop, but my general principles have been if the patients have macular degeneration, if the patients have advanced glaucoma, uh, then these patients already have reduced contrast sensitivity, so I wouldn't use 
uh, any multifocality as the primary cataract procedure. The advantage of using add-on multifocality is patients have already had cataract operations and probably in their 60s and 70s. And if these patients have mild disease, either with mild AMD or mild glaucoma, then you have got the option of offering them the solution of uh, having presbyopia correction. But the great advantage is if it starts to affect the disease or if patients have a lot of dysphotopsias or if they have any issues, then you have the advantage <coughs> of going and removing it. Um, because then they are back to square one where they had a primary monofocal. The problem comes when the patients had primary trifocal IOL well in the capsular bag, and then they have used to the quality of vision and that they have enjoyed that amount of spectacular independence. And then it's much difficult sell to asking them to explant, and then you have the complications of explantation if you leave it longer. So Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, we were talking in the first part of the symposium about uh, two types of lenses, the trifocal lenses, the head of lenses, and I would like to collect the experience of very high volume uh, doctor like uh, Javier and Ramon. I would like to know overall if all of us, we could know that uh, the head of refractive lenses probably are the real head of lenses instead of the head of refractive lenses in terms of reducing this photopsia. You are implanted of BBT, you are implanted also of Elon lenses. What is your opinion about the dysphotopsia and the intermediate vision in the, this pilot study that you developed, uh, Ramon and Javier? Yes. I think that I have uh, said before, uh, in this case, with the optical design of this lens, the long lens, uh, the same with uh, BBT lens, we can play with the micro monovision in order to improve the near vision without decrease the quality of the distant vision. A uh, uh, timing ago, when we started with <coughs> AT Lara Symphony Lens, we <laughs> wanted or we wish to improve the near vision. For this, we use some micro monovision. At the end, the result, more pheno photo phenomena in the uh, dim condition. Yeah, the, the same comments and the same behavior, at least in my practice. Uh, the, this kind of lenses in my practice are recommended for patients that they can be implanted with trifocals. It's true that in my private practice, the majority of them are looking for independence of glasses, and I think that this platform, uh, or in general, the of intraocular lenses, they can offer that, and yes, the trifocal, but I explained them perfectly uh, about uh, this photopsia phenomena, and if the patient is related with the possibility to live with independence of, of uh, reading glasses, the first option, for refractive lens exchange is a trifocal intraocular lens. But if the patient has other kind of pathology, uh, some epiretinal membranes or other kind of pathology, is the second option. But I think that is not a good option for myopics because they are looking for reading distances similar that they had or for emetropics because I practice about the two, three percent of my refractive lens exchange are emetropic, older than 55, older than 60, but I have that kind of demand. Other world is the world related with cataracts. The majority of them are looking for to see. For them, offer the possibility to live free of glasses for intermediate distance is excellent. And the real practice in my, in my area is that for the majority of them, they offer also the possibility to obtain independence of reading glasses because they don't read so much, and offering them in the second eye the possibility to objective of 0 0.50, 0 0.75. The tolerance with this kind of lenses is better than with the trick focus. It's possible to do that, mini monovision, and could be excellent, and I obtain a very huge group of patients free of glasses. Okay, and the, the last question would be, well, based on the literature, the evidence, we know exactly what could be the performance of this type of lens, a trifocal, that head of, in the intermediate, in near. We also know the percentage of the dysphotopsia in the patient. We, we have more and more information about all the lenses. The lenses are developed evidence, of course. But I would like to know, probably all of us would like to know, with an excellent surgeon like you, uh, how do you decide, involve, the take decision 
about the intraocular lens, the profilometry of the lens with the patient. How do you discuss, uh, how do you involve on, in this uh, decision? In some way, what is your uh, particular tricks for that or how to manage what is uh, your art in this situation in order to adapt the expectation in the preoperative to the results that you know you are going to achieve with each lens? The main issue related with that is that uh, when the patient is thinking about the, to be implanted with a trifocal intraocular lens, this photopsia <laughs> is the main message that they transmit them. And also I explain or I ask him or them about if they are dri professional drivers or if they have some, some profession and if they use computers and that kind of things. And uh, I explained perfectly with images the phenomen, the dysphotopsia phenomena, especially the positive phenomena, because uh, uh, and they are the more important relative with that. And in my own practice, only one per 500 patients exchange the intraocular lenses related with dysphotopsia, positive dysphotopsia, no more. Another other commentary. Okay, well. We have finished the time of the symposium. Thank you very much for your attendance, and I expect you to have here the next year. Thank you very much.